At the 11th hour, on the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, the guns of the First World War finally fell silent. But for many people, that wasn't the end of it, and there was very, very little to celebrate. And given the year we've been through and what's been happening with coronavirus, I think it's only fitting to remember all of those who died in the Spanish flu pandemic, because of course the Spanish flu pandemic was in many ways a direct consequence of the war. It was brought to Europe by American troops and it was spread very, very quickly in crowded conditions at the front line and in the hospitals. And it was compounded by the fact that governments all over Europe and America suppressed it for fear of damaging public morale. And in fact, the reason it's called Spanish flu is because Spain was neutral and it was the only country that actually recognized there was a problem going on. So Peggy Martin, who was a, VI, a VAD at number 55 General Hospital in Vimera in Flanders, she wrote that she remembered this. Armistice Day was the most appalling day I've ever lived through. We had a big convoy of flu cases and Sister was very busy, so she asked me to go along to represent the ward at a little ceremony they were going to have. A little Thanksgiving service in the open air by the flagstaff with the last post and a silence after it. And as I was walking to the flagstaff, I saw two parents being escorted to the mortuary. They must have been sent for to come and see their wounded boy and got there too late. And now here they were being taken to see his body. I thought, here we are at the end of the war, but we're not at the end of the grief. In the evening, my three chums and I had a little session in our huts after supper. One of the girls had been down in the town and brought back a bottle of wine and some biscuits. We had a little party, just the four of us. Then we tossed up the cork of the bottle because whoever got it would be the first to be married. And Mia Venables got it, and she was. Lorna Neal of the Motor Ambulance Company at the main base in Etapel near Calais remembers this. It was a terrible day. Sometimes we had to do fatigues and it was my turn that day to drive the lorry to take the men to the dump to shovel coal. I didn't feel a bit elated. The men who were shoveling coal were quite depressed and one of them said, so that's it then, the bloody war's over. It wasn't an exciting time at all. We wanted to go out and celebrate in the evening, but they wouldn't let us out. And in any case, it wasn't easy to feel, to feel jubilant, surrounded by rows and rows of white crosses and acres and acres of hospitals with beds full of wounded men. We just thought, thank God it's over. Let's go home. Among those who survived the war and was left to try and make sense of, their, of his experience and pick up the pieces of his life was the poet Siegfried Sassoon. Have you forgotten yet? For the world's events have rumbled on since those gag days, like traffic halted at a crossing of city ways. And the haunted gap in your mind has filled with thoughts that flow like clouds in the lit heaven of life. And you're a man reprieved to go, taking your share of time with joy to spare. But the past is still the same and war's a bloody game. Have you forgotten yet? Look down and swear by the slain of the war that you'll never forget. Do you remember the months we held the sector near Mametz, the nights you watched and wired and piled sandbags on parapets? Do you remember the rats, the stench of corpses rotting in front of the frontline trench and dawn coming dirty white and chill with hopeless rain? Do you ever stop and think, 
Could it all happen again? Do you remember the hour of din before the attack and the anger, the blind compassion that seized you then as you gazed upon the doomed and haggard faces of your men? Do you remember the stretcher cases lurching back with lolling heads and dying eyes, those ashen grey masks of the faces of the lads who once were kind and keen and gay? Have you forgotten yet? Look up and swear by the green of the spring that you'll never forget. So we're here in the tunnel for the third commemoration of Remembrance Sunday in the tunnel. Very different to last year because due to lockdown we can't be here on the day in real time so we've pre-recorded this. So one of the things that the Victoria Tunnel is famous for was its involvement in the Second World War when it was used as a deep underground public air raid shelter serving inhabitants from Biker all the way up through Newcastle. Um, but it also has numerous links with the First World War and these can be found in some of the safety features that were put in when the tunnel was built. So along behind me we have blast walls it's because during the First World War they learned that blast loses its force when it goes round corners. So we have three sets of concrete walls with a zigzag passage in between. Another safety feature is this one, a square of yellow paint and this actually harks back to one of the greatest horrors of the First World War because this is gas detection paint. A big worry was the use of chemical weapons and particularly mustard gas. They knew that Mussolini's air force in the 1930s had used mustard gas bombs to devastating effect in Abyssinia. And of course, if, if, um, if Mussolini's got that technology, so has Hitler. And if mustard gas had landed above us here, it would have got into the tunnel. So this would have, set, would have um, turned pink and hopefully given some warning. The horrors of chemical warfare are best summed up by Wilfred Owen in his famous poem, Dulce et Decorum Est. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep, some had lost their boots but limped on, bloodshot. All were lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf, even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly from behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but one man still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering as a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light I saw him drowning. In all my dreams he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some fevered dream you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and see the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from froth-corrupted lungs, Obscene as cancer, bitter as the taste of vile, corrupted sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not recite with, with, with such glee to children, children ardent for some distant glory, the old lie. Dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. So we're now at... We're now at the point in the tunnel that is directly underneath Tarsit Street in Newcastle and every year in some way we mark the two minute silence just here. And the reason we always do it here is because this was the scene of a terrible tragedy during the Second World War. 
So on the night of the 7th and 8th of May 1941, a bomb fell on Tarsit Street, directly above where I'm standing now, and nobody was killed or injured, but what did happen was it took the, it took the backs off a terrace of four houses, and it left behind a crater. When you think of a crater, a lot of people will be thinking of the type of crater you get in a volcano, or the craters on the moon where you have essentially a cone shape. But this was different, it was something called a camouflet, which forms when a high explosive bomb penetrates underground before it goes off. So you have a very narrow opening, almost like a shaft, and then it opens up. There were no resources available to repair this crater. All the resources and manpower was being prioritised onto critical infrastructure. All they could do was put some tarpaulin over the opening and hope for the best. And for a couple of weeks, everything was all right until the 31st of May, when a little girl called Irene Page, who was seven years old, was asked by her mam to go and take a message to a lady living in one of the damaged houses. Irene went off, delivered her message, and then we're not sure how it happened, but Irene slipped and fell into the camouflet, and nobody could get a response from her. So there's a bit of panic among the adults because they knew there was a little girl down in this crater. She wasn't answering anybody. Nobody quite knew what to do until a young hero came along and took charge. His name was Ernie Smith and he was known as Sonny to his friends and family. Sonny Smith was 12 years old and he was a Boy Scout. He said, don't worry, I've just passed my knot tying badge. Fetch me a rope or a clothesline. I'll tie around at one end around my waist. I'll go into the crater and I'll get Irene out. And for a while, it seemed as though this was going to work. The rope was paying out. Sonny was talking to the people up above. And then the rope stopped moving. And nobody could get a response from Sonny. Meanwhile, someone had remembered that in the next street were two off-duty firemen called George Wanless and John Tulip and had gone to fetch them to come and help. Now, possibly rather unfortunately, John Tulip was actually the little girl's uncle. And I say unfortunately because when he heard who it was in the crater, he forgot all his training, rushed down into the crater to try and get Irene out and he was very quickly overcome, and so was his friend George Wanless, who went in after him. By this time, the fire brigade had arrived. They'd had to send somebody right up to the top of a hill here, where there was a first aid post, but the fire brigade arrived, and leading fireman George Bruce went in to assess the situation. He was also overcome, but fireman Larry Young, who the papers at the time said was made of sterner stuff, he went in and managed to get George Bruce out by holding his breath. Larry Young then went in four more times and brought out four bodies because sadly they had all perished. When the bomb had gone off, because there was a limited oxygen supply underground, it had created a pocket of carbon monoxide. And when little Irene went in and disturbed that, she was quickly overcome and died, would have died very quickly, and so would the others. For some years, the story was persisting that the accident was Irene's fault, that she was a naughty girl doing something that she should have be, shouldn't have been. But actually, the truth was far from that. She was just helping her mam out and she was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it was a terrible tragedy of war. Sonny Smith was awarded the Boy Scouts Bronze Cross, which is their highest award for bravery, and Larry Young was awarded the George Medal, and George Wanless and George Bruce received commendations for gallantry. And it's very fitting that every year we remember 
them and all the other civilian casualties of war and remember that it wasn't just the fighting forces that were in terrible danger.